So I'll start with a bit of, of the motivation of why I'm passionate about this work. It actually comes from my grandfather. And this is a picture on the right of my grandfather shaking the hand of former US President Jimmy Carter. And my grandfather was actually a conservationist. And he focused all of his energy on saving certain species of fish in the rivers and lakes of Pennsylvania. And people would always ask him, well, why do you care about the fish? What's so important about the fish? And he famously said once in one of his conservationist reports was that if the fish can't survive in the water, there are serious problems for man. And in fact, there was a report that came out two weeks ago that said in the past 40 years, half of the wildlife on Earth has disappeared. Half of the wildlife. And the major driver behind this is because of loss of habitat due to global warming, which is a, the, the result of fossil fuel burning that produces CO2 in our atmosphere. So if we want to take care of the other 50% of the wildlife, and including ourselves, humanity as a species, we need to move past fossil fuels and find different sources of energy. So in fact, what we need are renewable sources of energy ones that are large scale, ones that can cover the whole earth, that are abundant and available. And if we look at all the different sources of energy we could pull from in a little chart here, we can see there's one obvious choice for what is the, gonna be the power source of the future. For reference, this little brown circle over here is the amount of energy that the world currently uses in a whole year. And if we look at all the different possible sources of energy, we obviously see that the sun is the only one that is abundant and available enough to power the world. If we want to put this in some form of perspective, we know that the sun gives us on Earth the same amount of energy in one hour that the entire planet uses in one year. So the sun is by far, if we're going to move to renewable energy economy, the sun has to be the choice. But then you may say, well, what do we do when the sun is not here? So in a few hours when the sun is down, how do we use the power of the sun? So then the key challenge is storage of this solar energy. So being able to use the power of the sun when the sun isn't available. And for this, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can, in fact, look to what nature has been doing for the past two billion years in photosynthesis. So plants use light, CO2, and water to create sugar and oxygen. So in fact, if any of you have ever eaten a vegetable or a fruit in your life, you have been eating the power of the sun and using the sun to power yourself. So all of you have been running on solar fuels your entire life so far. So what we want to do with our technology is a type of artificial photosynthesis. So we can use light and water to then split the, the water and get out oxygen and hydrogen. And there, hydrogen will be our energy carrier and our way to store solar energy. This here is actually a real picture of our artificial leaf device. So this is a real thing that we have. So now we have the idea that we can store solar energy in the in form of hydrogen. But if we really want to make this technology available to everyone in the world, to the big cities in the first world, to the small villages in the third world, the major driver is going to be cost. We have to make this really, really cheap. In order to make this cheap, we need to use cheap materials and cheap processing. So our group, our whole team at TU Delft, we focus only on silicon-based devices. Silicon, we think, is the only way to make this technology uh, available and cost-effective for the future. And we can use this by looking at the cost of silicon photovoltaic cells for the past uh, few decades. The price has been bottoming out. And we use the same exact silicon processing technology in our group to make the silicon. If you've ever seen a silicon solar panel on a roof, 95% of all solar cells on a roof are made from silicon. So this is already a robust, scalable industry. So if we put all these together, storing sunlight in the form of hydrogen using silicon, we come to our device at Teyu Delft. And this is a short demonstration of how it works. We have our silicon-based system here. We put it into a water-based solution. The light comes through, and instead of creating electricity, we transfer solar energy into chemical energy, and we use this to split water and create hydrogen and oxygen. So this is a nice little schematic that shows how it works. But in fact, we have two functional devices already at TU Delft that work. And this is a demonstration of just one of them. So we have our system in here. The light absorbing material is this greenish material. Light hits it in the solution. We form oxygen bubbles at the surface here. We just connect it to a wire, to a metal other electrode, which is producing hydrogen like a champ. So what we really need the TEDx community and for your uh, uh, investment and, and technology is to move this from the lab scale up to a bigger scale. We can do this cheap, we can do this efficient, but we need to do it bigger. And one of the most driving reasons is that we know next year, 2015, will be the first rollout of fuel cell cars. To uh, uh, Toyota will be the first one to get one, and all the other major automotive companies are right behind them. Fuel cells run on hydrogen and oxygen. 
So this technology can be the fuel of the future that is clean, environmental, that can take care of the whole planet and all of humanity as a species for centuries and millennia to come. And the only way that we can do this is with the power of the sun and with our artificial leaf. Thank you very much for your attention.